we welcome Dr. Cindy Devers to the show. I've been looking forward to this one. <laughs> Me too. Let's, uh, let's jump right in with our icebreaker question. What is your favorite superpower? Well, I'm reading your mind right now. So oh. uh. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. This is a good start. So I already have that one. But um, actually, I was just talking to my daughter about this, our oldest daughter. I, I would like to have a mulligan. That's what I would like for my superpower. Okay. So um, are you a golfer? Yes. So, you know, I mean, you get a, a do-over, right? Right. So she always complains that, you know, you're so much nicer to Kenna. That's her younger sister. Uh-huh. And she gets away with so much stuff. And you always do this or that. And I think, you know, I need a mulligan because <laughs> you were the first one. I had to try it out, you know. And you know, you know, you'll be a parent soon. And it's difficult. I mean, there's always these things that crop up. You think you're ready, but you're never quite ready for. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of things I'd like a mulligan for. But, but that one would be one in particular. I think I think a lot of parents feel that way. They're I've I've heard that theme before. They're very very like um, not necessarily tough. Sometimes tough, but but very precise and deliberate with the first child. And then by the time um, number two or number three or number right. four or beyond uh, comes along, they're they're feeling a little bit more. Eh, just let it happen. You know, they're going to be <laughs> fine. Um, and. Sometimes the first child resents that. I felt like it was pretty much the same for all of us, or they treated us as equally as they could. The thing my dad always said was, it's not going to be fair, but it'll be as fair as we can make it. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, that's all you can do, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, though, it's just out of sheer exhaustion with the second one. Right? <laughs> just like, I'm just so tired. Okay. Yeah. Stay out as late as you want. <laughs> do your thing. Do your thing. As we often do, we're going to steal a few questions from a previous guest, Mike Alexander. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. It's about 75 miles north of Detroit, straight up by 75. Car country. How many in your family growing up? I had a brother. So it was just me and my brother and my parents. Okay. All of our family was there. My mom's parents were there and her brothers and sisters and the same for my dad. So we were a pretty close family growing up. Yeah. What was your first job? <laughs> I read this question and I tried to remember. And it was actually, it was, a, it was kind of a crappy job because I was cleaning up for the Little League field, you know, a little stick with a, a poker on the end of it. And you had to pick up oh, trash, yeah. right? But, um, but it, was, it was an interesting experience. And it was kind of my uh, first foray into business because they put the poker sticks in the concession stand. And so we were like, you know, 10, 12 years old. And so we'd go in the concession stand. Just us. Well, you know what's in the concession stand? All the candy, right? Yeah. (laughs) And so we couldn't help ourselves, but, you know, to take some candy and eventually we got caught. Right. And so I asked him, I said, well, why would you put candy and the poker sticks in the same place and give us a key? Because you know we're going to eat the candy. And so that was my first, like, I think you need to really have a good process when you run a business. (laughs) (laughs) Your first work. I got fired, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, uh, I, I had to pay it. all the candy money back, too. Right. What was your greatest challenge as a child? <laughs> My greatest challenge as a child? I think I think it was, see, I'm a lot older than you. And so mm-hmm. boys had boy roles and girls had girl roles. Okay. And so that was difficult for a lot of us who are athletes because boys were athletes and girls were not athletes. And if you were, it wasn't very serious. Right. And so I remember I was probably eight years old. And our neighbor was moving out. And so he gave my dad his basketball hoop. And so my dad put it on our garage. And so I went out the next day and I was shooting baskets. And I said, thank you, Mr. Levi, for giving us your basketball hoop. And he said, well, that's not for you. That's for your brother. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, girls don't play basketball. And so that was kind of my, that, that just kind of seared in my mind. Yeah, so yeah, I just I remember that I uh, because it was very different. I mean, it's still different. I mean, do a lot of, and, and so does Shannon, do a lot of gender research. And, and there still are a lot of stereotypes and, and those gender biases has, haven't disappeared. But I think that was hard for me to reconcile. I was like, wait a minute. That was my first like, wait, <laughs> how come I can't play basketball? Right. Or how come I can't do this or I can't do that? So, yeah, yeah I think that was a challenge for, for a lot of, I think it still is, but what, for me so, anyway. Is, is playing off of that, what do you think, I, I do think we've made some progress in those areas. Mm-hmm. What do you think are the places where those biases are still most present? Um, I, I think they're present everywhere. I think some things are better. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think people make an effort to make things better, but they're still a lot. It's socialized in. Mm-hmm. So women still have these roles right. and they're still seen as communal and they're seen as the caregivers That's and true. they're seen as the kind of motherly role. And it's really hard to reconcile with the leader role. Mm-hmm. And so we see it. You know, if you think about the S&P 1500, there are more CEOs named John than there are female CEOs. Oh, I was not aware. <laughs> 5%. Yeah. And so it's pretty small. Hmm. I do think one thing that I noticed in the MBA program was it seemed like there were so many more boxes that, that I wouldn't say that the female students were expected to check, but maybe that they felt like they were expected to check. And, and, you know, maybe in some of those cases, you know, expectation is reality. Mm -hmm. Um, But just in terms of, um, attending certain social functions or, um, uh, or reacting, even just reacting to things in a certain way and being present for other members of the class in a certain way. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of times there are not those expectations on men. I don't know. I'm not sure how to, not sure how to kind of crystallize that, but. Well, I think you're right because I've talked to some CEOs and um, one that I talked to last month said, you know, I have to be tough, but I also have to bring the birthday cakes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's it. And and I think a lot of, I think there are some, there are some men who feel responsible in that way, but a lot of them, they, they I feel like men in business feel much more free to draw their own boundaries in that sense. Definitely. Um, and that's of course not fair. What did your parents uh, family do for a living and how did that impact you? My dad was a vice president of a bank. And so he was right when, uh, when computers were coming into, like everybody knew what a computer was, right? Yeah. Um, it was before you had a computer in your home. And he said, everyone's going to have a computer in their home. And I was like, oh, dad, no way. <laughs> <laughs> now I have one in my pocket. Right. Um, but he would take us to work on Saturdays because they had to run everything um, on Saturdays when the banks were closed. And mm-hmm. so they could do all their tests. And probably about three times the size of this room was this giant computer a Univac computer. Mainframe. And it had just teeny, I mean, it had these huge uh, tapes yeah. that were, you know, what we have now for basically memory cards, right? Yeah. And um, they were like gigantic tapes. And I just remember going in that room with them almost every Saturday. I don't know why I went to work with them. My brother and I did. I think we just thought it was cool to see this, you know, worrying computer. Yeah. Uh, but he, he'd run all these tests. And so that was pretty cool. So we got to see, you know, so I, I always kind of grew up with computers. So that was pretty neat. Mm-hmm. My mom's a teacher. But um, she didn't go to college until after we went to school. Okay. And so she went to school at night, and then she got her degree. And so she did her student teaching while we were in high school and was a substitute teacher while I was in high school at our high school. So that was kind of fun. Yeah. So um, I got a lot of um, educational part from her, and I got the business part from my dad. So kind of put them together, became a business professor. Fun stuff. (laughs) So the tapes, the computer tapes, you said memory cards, kind of like the, I I guess in the 80s and 90s, we went to like floppy disks and hard. It was Well, there were punch cards first, and then these Uh were gigantic um, actual tape. Right. Yeah, and so you'd have to take them. I can't remember what they were called, but you had to take like cartridges and you had to put them in. And, and so they, they would store everything. So they'd have to take them out like you were taking out discs. Yeah. Makes sense. Huh. Give us 60 seconds on your road to Mays. My road to Mays came here twice. So the first, my very first job was here after I finished my PhD at Michigan State. Uh-huh. And then I left. My family was still in Michigan. And so it was just too difficult to, to coordinate going back and forth to Michigan. And so then um, I took a job in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin. So I could drive. It's a pretty long flight from here to Saginaw, Michigan. It's like three or four airports, right? Yeah. Um, I didn't want to leave. I loved it here. And I knew I would always come back. And so when the girls went to college, we moved back here. So now we're here. Great. One of the one of the ways that uh, you and I bonded right up front, I don't know if you knew this at the time, but you, I think during admitted students weekend, mm-hmm. three years ago, um, for the for my MBA class, you gave our class one of the two best pieces of advice I got in the MBA program, which was people often come in here feeling like they need to prove how smart they are. Don't worry about that. Be thirsty to learn. I remember you used mm-hmm. that phrase, be thirsty to learn. Focus on inputs, basically, not outputs. Um, my question is, 
why, and I always appreciated that you said that, and it really, it, it shaped me as a student. My question is, why do you think people feel a need to prove their brain power in the first place to, are they jockeying for position, so to speak? Is that just a natural human instinct with a new group? Like, well, I, I think it's that. natural for MBAs because you are competitive by nature or you wouldn't be yeah. in an MBA program. Yeah. And so I think it's, it's a competition thing. Right. And I think it's, there's so many students that come into an MBA program and they get in and then they're like, oh my God, now I really have to do this. I'm scared to death. And yeah. so they're just trying to cover the fact that they're afraid. <laughs> and so they have to show how smart they are. Right. Right. Um, and so that part's human nature, I think, because you, you have mm. a weakness. But in, in society, and particularly in the, the United States, we don't we don't reward vulnerability and failure. That's and so it's, it's just trained true. out of us. And so if you open yourself up and you say, I don't know something, yeah. then somebody else is going to know it. And so then you feel that that other person is going to take an advantage over you. So I think it's in the way that we're socialized. True. And so you have to be able, and it's hard, right? And I think that's why I like this program, because from the very beginning, we talk about, and everyone talks about the fact that you have to make yourself vulnerable, that you have to open up. And some students are much better at that than others. Right, right. <laughs> and some will never do it. But yes. those who do it, you can see tremendous growth. And, and so that's the exciting part, I think, for all of us. What, how do you think your understanding of vulnerability has evolved over the course of your career? And I, I think that vulnerability is a little bit in vogue right now. Um, I think we're, we're first we're sort of as a, as a business culture and as a society start, sort of starting to take hold of it and say, this is an inefficiency. Like this is something that's really important that we haven't really grabbed onto yet. Um, but what do you think that journey has looked like for our society and specifically for you in terms of understanding that and how important it is? Well, I think, I think it's important. I don't, I don't know if people have really grasped it yet yeah. or not. I think the successful people have. Yeah. And I mean, you can't be vulnerable all the time. Right? I mean, eventually <laughs> you have to know something. <laughs> what do you mean? Right? And so when, do you, when are you able to, to, to do it at the right times, I yeah. think, and, and that takes a lot of practice. Sure does. Um, you have, you've been successful publishing in business management. You focused on corporate government, governance, excuse me, and strategic decisions made by organizational leaders. What first sparked your interest in strategy and strategic management? When I started in the PhD program, I started in um, the micro side, organizational behavior. Yeah. And so I took a seminar in organizational behavior and I hated it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Off to a good start. <laughs> I, it, was, it was, you know, it was very, very micro about people's personalities yeah. and, you know, what their look is. You know, and all that stuff is, is interesting to a certain extent. It just didn't grab me. Okay. And so I thought, wow, I made a mistake. <laughs> I should never came to get a PhD. And I know we're going to talk about this later, but it's very different. I mean, you can find out all kinds of information about an MBA program mm -hmm. or a master's program, but there's, there, it's really kind of secret what a PhD program is all about until you're in it funny you mentioned that. <laughs> and then once you're in it, then it's like, oh, what is this? You're right, yeah. you know, and, and then you have to make yourself vulnerable because you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting in a room for four hours talking about six articles. And you're like, what am I doing here? Especially if you don't like the subject. Right. And so I thought, wow, this is just the wrong thing for me. And then I took the strategy course and I was like, oh, thank you. Here we are. This one. <laughs> this one works for this me. One, this so one. Um, then I got hooked up with a professor who was doing um, executive compensation research. And so you kind of get, you know, if eventually you find your mentor in a PhD program. And, and that was my mentor. His name is Bob Wiseman. And then I have another one, Jerry McNamara. And they're both, he was, Jerry was doing decision making and Bob was doing executive compensation with behavioral decision making mixed into it. And so that, that kind of shaped me as a PhD student. And so then I got involved with executive compensation as a form of corporate governance. And then got into boards of directors, M&A, and, and kind of just snowballed from there. Right. And all of that showed up in our strategy class that you taught mm -hmm. in our spring semester, I guess, of our first year. Right. Um, right down to negotiation. Uh, we did talk about M&A a fair bit, I think. 
Give us a brief overview of your research. So right now I focus on, I still focus on executive compensation. Um, like I've been doing a lot of gender research, which is kind of interesting, just trying to understand um, um, what, what are these barriers for women? Why do we have so few women in the upper echelon? Oh. You know, there's an argument that there's not enough in the pipeline. Right. There's also an argument that, you know, you hear about the lean in stuff that, that women don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there's a fair bit of that because... I mean, so there, a study just came out. It's a good study, and it shows that female CEOs are more likely to get fired than male CEOs. Oh. And it's kind of rare for a CEO to actually get fired, okay. terminated. So, right. um, and so, just it's kind of troubling that female CEOs. Sure. <laughs> if we're trying to get more female CEOs, but they're more likely to be fired, and they're more likely. So, and there's all kinds of research that that shows that if a, if a man fails. And a, and, a, and a woman fails, that the woman's penalized. I mean, all, th all other things equal, penalized more heavily. And if they're successful, hmm. then the male CEO is rewarded higher than the female CEO, all things equal as well. And so there's still a lot of bias, even at the high upper echelons of firms, that make it difficult. So if you're thinking about, if you're a female CEO and you're a vice president and you're making good money and you're going to take the leap to be a CEO... Well, if you're more likely to be fired and you're less likely to be compensated for good <laughs> yeah. performance and, you know, share, uh, activist shareholders are more likely to target female firms, female ed firms. And so there's all these bad things that are happening. I mean, there's a lot of good things that happen, too. But for, for a female, there's so many biases that it, you know, if I'm going to take this job where I'm going to have a light shining on me because, one, I'm different. And right. two, there's only 5% of me, and so yeah. I'm rare and unique, then to take that leap to that next level is, is, is pretty scary. Sure. So we just finished the study just yesterday, and what we found is that female CEOs it get way more severance, significantly amount more severance pay in their package they negotiate uh, before they take a CEO job. And um, we think that that's a form of insurance. And so we talk to female oh. CEOs because if they if, if you terminate if you're a CEO and you lose your job, it's hard to get another same level job. And it's even harder for women. It takes women two times, three times as long to get a, a comparable job once they mm -hmm. lose a job. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are still weighing against women. And so that's that's a lot of the research that I'm doing, trying to figure out what are those things that make female CEOs or female leaders more likely to want to take a CEO job. And so what we find is that, I mean, it's not surprising that the more females there are in the industry, especially as CEOs or boards are, are on the boards of directors, the more likely those women are to take those jobs. And then it lowers their amount of severance. So they feel more comfortable about taking those jobs. Hmm. So that's some of the research. I do a lot of reputation research right now, too. So that's something that's kind of new for me, and it's, it's exciting for me. It's out of the, the – so if you look at corporate governance as a form of social or, or a formal control mechanism, we look at things like reputation as social control mechanisms. And so, what are you, what are you so, learning So there? if you think about your reputation, it's a collective belief about you, yes, right? How's right. that? Or a collective belief about a firm. And so okay. they have to build those. Yes. Reputations, right? And so the interesting thing that we see is that, that firms spend a lot of time and a lot of money building their reputations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's some dark side to reputation because if you're known for something and that helps you yes. and it makes your customers feel more, they can, they can predict your behavior and so they feel more comfortable with you. You have to keep doing it. And so it puts you okay. in a box. And so you can't explore new things and not do what you're known for doing. And if you're doing what you're known for doing, then it makes it more difficult to spend a lot of time and effort doing something else. Uh -huh. And so they become more insular and they get locked into what they're doing because they feel trapped by their own reputation. So that's some of the things that we're looking at. Right. I think there's, there's sort of a form of that in advertising. I mean, which right. is a form of reputation mm -hmm. building. Um, you know, like I expect at, you know, the Super Bowl or the Olympics or whatever, I'm going to see a McDonald's commercial at some point. Mm -hmm. I'm going to see a Nike commercial at some point. I'm going to see a, a Coca-Cola commercial sure. at some point. And I guess um, I could I could pretty easily see how companies like that feel like this is what we're expected to do. Right. And so we have to spend a certain amount of resources doing this and doing anything else. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So you incorporate a fair bit of psychology 
Mm -hmm. um, as we, you know, we learned in our negotiation discussions and the strategy class and so forth. Uh, we've talked a lot on the show about things like trust, value creation, reputation, as we just touched on, and, uh, and on compensation, as we've been talking about. What is the most counterintuitive insight you could share with a business regarding the psychology of business? Um, I mean, maybe it's what you just said, mm -hmm. but is there anything else you would and is there anything else you would want to say to a CEO or a COO, CFO, whatever, about the psychology of business? Well, I think that it, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to the psychology of business, but but one of the things that we talked about in negotiations, and I talk about this when I teach, particularly at the executive level, is trust. Okay. Right. So if you're 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 a supplier and I'm a purchaser, and so if I continually buy for if I continually buy from you, right, and you're continually selling to me, then we build a relationship likely, and then we become trust each other, yeah. and so then it's easy. Mm -hmm. So I just call him and say, hey, Ben, you know, I need this right now and sure. you can get it to me. And so I trust you and I, I know you. you're going to do it and I don't have to have formal contracts and, you know, I can I can let my guard down. And that's nice and that makes things more efficient for me. But what it also does is it creates opportunity costs because I don't pay attention to other opportunities that are outside you. True. And so I might become even less efficient because I'm not paying attention to, or I'm not pushing you to do it either higher quality or cheaper, mm -hmm. quicker, whatever it is, more reliable. And so I get shut off. And again, it's, it's just like your reputation, right? There's, there's a, everything has a dark side. Yeah. And so that's kind of where I'm looking at all of these constructs that, that people think are positive. You know, we have to create our reputation. We kind of continue to enhance our reputation. Well, at some point there's diminishing returns and at some point it might even become negative. Right. And so if I get locked too, too tightly into a box with a supplier trust or with my reputation, and then it can begin to harm me. You see some of the same thing on sports teams. I think it was Phil Jackson that was saying sort of the life of the lifespan of a coach with a particular team where you can be effective mm -hmm. is I, I want to say it was seven years or something like mm -hmm. that is that is the amount of time where there's still sort of the tension, the kind of discomfort before everybody just sort of relaxes into right. their role. And it also reminds me of the thing that, um, but talking about the tension between the creative side and the business side of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And if you ever feel like you have reached an equilibrium, you've lost. Mm -hmm. um, same thing in sports. And it sounds like yeah. it relates back to what you're talking about as well, where there has to be enough, maybe enough discomfort, um, with the system that everyone is still sort of checking all the right boxes. I'm not sure exactly how to describe it. Does this make well, sense? Well, And you have to, you can't just be subconsciously doing things, right? There's right. gotta be some cognition there. Yeah. Right. True. Some active. True enough. Where do you think we've talked some about this already in terms of gender bias and so forth? Where do you think other big inefficiencies remain in modern business? I like the, you're, a lot of these questions you're answering before we get to them, <laughs> which is great. I would expect that from you. <laughs> well, I think that the, the, if I could change one thing yeah. about business, it would be the short term attitude. Right. Because you know, think about how often do, do you check your stock portfolio, right? Every five minutes if you want to. Sure. And it's quarterly, you know, at best. Right. Um, at the longest. And that's just not enough time to do the things that you want to do long term. Yeah. And so we talked a lot about this in the strategy class, right? You yeah. do things on an operational basis. What do I have to get done today? What are the things that are in, in my obstacles today? Mm -hmm. What are the, the goals that I have? What are my objectives? You know, how am I going to be evaluated? And if it's quarterly, then I'm going to do things to, to meet those objectives quarterly. But if you're doing things in a very short-term manner, you're not going to be able to think about the long-term. And so businesses need to think about the long-term. And I kind of heard, and I can't remember exactly what the stat was, but I talked to, we interviewed some CEOs. And this one CEO of a private firm said he would never go back to being a CEO of a public firm. And we said, why not? And oh, I kind of knew the answer. He said, there's too much short-term pressure. Yeah. And he said, as a matter of fact, I, I talked to a lot of CEOs. And any, any good firm who can raise the capital or get some backing will go private. And he said, I think that all the good firms at some point are going to be private. And so all the investors will have left to invest in, and just the regular investors like you and me, right. will have the poor firms. 
And I thought, that's kind of scary. That is kind of scary. Uh, but you can see how that happens. There's so much regulation, which some of it's good and some of it's just overbearing regulation. Right. And so much short-term pressure that for a CEO going private, it's pretty attractive. What what sorts of things are private firms required? Like, I guess they're not required to disclose anything to the public. I mean, by definition, they're private. But... W- do they have to, I'm trying to think of if you wanted to become, you know, like if, let's just say you're not an accredited investor, but you're interested in investing in private firms. Mm-hmm. Like what are the, what are the barriers to entry in a system like that? I mean, maybe we're just, maybe we're just speculating here, but I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's things like Kickstarter, right? And so you got yeah. crowdfunding. I mean, you can invest in, in firms in certain ways, right? Yeah. Uh, but to invest in a, a, when a firm goes private, they, it, to, if they can, they want to pick their own investors, mm. right? Because they want people that have, that share their vision. Right. And so if it's a long-term vision or if it's a vision for corporate social responsibility, whatever that particular mission and vision of that firm is, they want to match with their investors if they can, hmm. right? And so they want to be able to, and, and they don't want to deal with a lot of investors. They want to deal with a few investors. Right. Because it's much easier to deal with three people than it is 30,000 people. <laughs> that is unquestionably right? true. And so um, I think it's, it's about, if you can, selecting your own. Now, not everybody can do that, right? I mean, something you got to go in and pitch, venture capital, those types of things. But, but I think the the good firms can do those things at least to a certain extent. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I don't think all the good opportunities will go away, but I think that they're shrinking. Uh, yeah, right? That makes sense. You, you, as we discussed, you teach negotiation to executives and students across a variety of programs. What is the most common mistake people make in negotiating? Not negotiating. Ah. <laughs> Avoiding it. Uh-huh. I think um, there's a lot of people who are afraid to yeah. negotiate. And, um, and, and, and it's hard. And it's seen as a competition. And, you know, you know from our class, it doesn't have to be. It can be very collaborative. Yeah. But it takes a lot of work. And it's hard to negotiate. It takes a lot more preparation than it does time to prep for a negotiation than it does actually do the negotiation. And so a lot of people just, they say they don't have the time, Mm -hmm. but they just really don't want to do it. And so they they find all kinds of excuses about why they didn't negotiate. So they have to start. How do you teach them to overcome that? Obviously, step one is be willing to do it, become willing to do it. And then what? Well, so, I mean, if you can give people small little wins, right? So and that's why I tell people, go into Kohl's and try to negotiate, right? Or go <laughs> And just practice, constantly practice negotiating. Keep a journal, practice, and you'll see how many rewards you get. And then it becomes, okay, I can do this, and it's fruitful for me. <laughs> I saved a lot of money, or I made a lot of money. Do you think it's easier for people in European countries or... South American countries, African countries, Europe and Africa in particular. I haven't been to South America, but in Europe and Africa, there's a lot more bargaining right. with shopkeepers mm-hmm. and things like that. Do you think it's easier for executives in those countries to negotiate just because they have the practice doing it? Well, you just grow up doing it and you're socialized right. and that's just a way of life, right? Hmm. I mean, everything that you buy, it's a barter. And so it just becomes ingrained. So mm-hmm. here it's not. You know, we go to the HEB and we buy our stuff and, you know, you're not, he's like, okay, can you give me 10 cents off that mango? You know, <laughs> <laughs> they probably would if you asked. Right. <laughs> Why do you think that that has, that has worked its way out of our culture? Well, the, I don't think it ever worked its way. I, I don't think it was ever in our culture. Why do you think it happened like that? I think it becomes more efficient for uh, people, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, if I go into the store and I have to, if I'm going to buy a bag of groceries, I'd right. have to negotiate over every single <laughs> item. It would take a long time. That's true. So I would guess it's probably, I don't know the answer to that. Not a history professor, but, right. um, I guess, or a sociology professor. Uh, but um, I would guess it's efficiency. Probably so. In terms of time. We are determined to be efficient. We're trying to be efficient, right. In the United States. Any particularly proud moments as a professor, as a teacher? My proudest moment is always when I hear from a student yeah. afterward. You know, some like I heard from one last week. You know, it's just like, oh my gosh, everything you said in class, it's true. I said, well, of course, that's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> 
But you know, it's and, you know, and you know, my class is different, right? It's not yeah. there's, there's there's data, but it's not numbers, right? And it's not right or wrong, right? There are right answers and there are wrong answers. But you know, I always tell the students, if there was only one right way to run a business, there'd only be one business, and there are a lot of businesses, and they meet a lot of different needs, and so you have to figure that out. And people, that's scary for people, right? Right, because you don't know the right answer, and so it's tough. But then when they get out there. And they're practicing these things. And then they send me an email and go, wow, you know what? When you said X or Y, whatever it was, it really works that way. Yeah. <laughs> or my firm doesn't know what they're doing. They don't have a strategy. <laughs> Help me. That right? sounds so, like an interesting yeah, So I, I like to hear from my students. Something I just thought of related to all this reputation um, discussion. When we, need, when we did negotiations in your class, there was a sense in which the students in our group, in our, in our cohort, we developed reputations mm-hmm. as negotiators yes. too. And it was, uh, I had classmates who were determined to kind of win the negotiation. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons that I really wanted to be a collaborative negotiator is because I felt like it made things easier. Mm-hmm. If your reputation is as someone who's trying to create value for everyone, you it's opportunity cost. Just right. like you said earlier, you can cut through a lot of the are you telling me the truth right now right. or are you just saying it because it helps your case? Mm-hmm. And if you if your reputation is as someone who just tells the truth and says, OK, let's work together here. Obviously, I want to get some value for myself, but I want to create some value for you if we can as well. How can we do that? That just seems most that seems most efficient in some way. Yeah. I don't know what question I'm asking again. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, you can tell the truth. That doesn't mean you're a bad negotiator, right? right. Or it doesn't mean that you're a softy. You right. just tell the truth. That you don't lie. There's not a lot of upside to being a jerk or being a liar, yeah, particularly like Kyle. if you're caught. Tell that to Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> there's not a lot of upside, but but there's a lot of downside. And you're right about the reputation. Mm-hmm. And so, so most negotiations, I mean, people think of a negotiation as like a spot transaction, right? You're going to yeah. sell your car to some guy you're never going to see again. Right. Um, but there's, you know, if you think about it, how many times in your life have you burned some bridge and thought, ah, oh, I'll never see that person again. And miraculously, yeah. five years later, they it's, show up in your life. You're so right. right. You're um, so right. And so, you know, you have one reputation and you have to protect it. You have to build it mm-hmm. and then you have to protect it. And it could be a good reputation or it could be a bad reputation. Yes. Right? So it's that's, hard to get rid of a bad reputation. That's more true now than it ever has been. <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, MySpace. Right, guys? MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> Any really difficult moments as a professor? I think the most difficult moment for me as a professor is when the people, they grapple with this, there's not one right answer. Yeah. I mean, that's the, the toughest part of a, a management professor's job, I think, you know, because there's a lot of science yeah. in the study of management, but the practice is an art. Uh-huh. And so they have, you have to practice and people, you know, they want to get it right. You want to yeah. learn how to do a, a regression model and you can figure that out and then it just stays with you. Well, if you want to learn how to be a manager, one, you have to learn about yourself and you have to open up yourself, right? Be vulnerable, figure out what you're not good at. You really have to start to listen and observe people's behavior. Yeah. One of the things that, that students are really good at, and, and we're all really good at this, by the way, is, is that, that you're really good listeners for pe- other people to stop talking so you can talk but you really have to hear what people are saying. So you can't just listen for me to stop talking. Then you have to hear what I'm saying, and then you have to respond. And Uh people aren't very good at that. And so it's it's tough to get people to start thinking and listening and hearing what people are saying and observing their behavior and then creating data from those behaviors Hmm. and then analyzing it. It's just a different way to do it. It's qualitative, not quantitative. Yeah, yeah. But if people don't want to do that, then well, yeah, it makes my job a lot harder. Yeah, I, I could I could see how like qualitative. It's sort of what what do we what do we do with this? Sometimes, what does it mean, and what do we do with it? Right. Um, and it's a skill to be able to observe other people's behaviors. People have to practice. I mean, you can do it, and some people do it naturally. But a lot of people they don't. Then they just wait, and wait for someone to stop talking and do their thing, say their piece. Let's move to some, let's move to some rapid fire. What do you consider your most valuable failure? That's a tough one. 
This is this is going to be an interesting one for me because you are you are one of the smartest people I know, and the, <laughs> just the way that you handle your lectures and the speed with which your mind works. And I have a bias towards speed. I mentioned this to, to Mike Alexander when he was on. I think of him as an incredibly smart person as well, and the reason is because he is so mm-hmm. fast. And maybe that bias is incorrect in some way, but your mind is very fast, <laughs> and so I'm I'm interested in hearing about your failures because speed. Speed of thought is something I respect a lot, and you have. A yeah, lot of well, it. <laughs> it's yeah, I've had so many failures. I'm trying to think of which one was the most impactful. I mean, getting fired when I was you know 10 years old or whatever it was when when I was working right. at the Little League Park. I mean, that's that's left a mark on me. Uh-huh. Um, and so it's it's kind of funny because um, you know when I took my my very first real job out of college. Um, I got hired at, at the university. I graduated and, and they hired me and I was in student life and I coached softball. Mm-hmm. And um, and so the head softball coach quit. He was my softball coach and I graduated. He wanted me to be the assistant and they wanted to work me into student life. Yeah. And so I had a, a bunch of kind of cobbled together jobs and it was kind of fun, right? You know, I just had graduated. Sure. And so then he quit right before the season started. And so I became a head coach like right in my first year, right? And so the, the most difficult thing was all my friends were on the team because I had played on the team the year before. Uh-huh. And these are like women in college, right? I mean, they're not like 12. Right. <laughs> not like little league or something. And so, I mean, I had a real job. I mean, we had to travel, you know, we'd go to Florida for spring training. And, you know, here I am at 21 years old coaching this team. And I just, I had a, it was, it was, Fun and we had an okay year of season, you know, win loss record wise, but but it was very difficult to manage my friends and I lost some friends because of it. Sure. And so um, I don't know if that classifies as a failure. I felt like a failure at that point. I learned a lot. I would have learned. I learned I shouldn't have taken that job right away. <laughs> right, right. But, but I did grow a lot from that. So that that was pretty impactful as well. This is a flavor I think of the same thing we were talking about earlier, where it's sort of like there's there's a certain amount of it's it, it, in this case it's maybe not discomfort but distance that you, you have to be able to create some level of distance with the people that you're telling basically what to right. do with their time and the nature of that relationship. Um, well, and you have to decide who plays and who doesn't too. And that was a big thing. Right. Right. So that was tough. Hmm. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? I think people think I'm scary really? and I'm not very scary. I don't think, I think they, I, I don't know. But yeah. Huh. Maybe I've mellowed in my old age. <laughs> hmm. If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? So this is an interesting question because um, it would be my great grandmother. It would be my mom's grandmother. Okay. And so I knew her and she passed when I was probably about 18, I think. Um, she came here from Hungary in the early 1900s, mm. you know, and, you know, her her mother and father owned a shop. They lived in, in Buda, a part of Buda in Pest, and um, on the Danube. And so they owned a small shop. And then her father passed away, and she had to quit school when she was 12. And so then she had to work in the shop. Okay. And then things got pretty scary in Eastern Europe. And so then right. um, her mother married someone from Saginaw, um, you know, like some friend that had emigrated over here. And so then they came over um, and so went through Ellis Island and, and came through and ended up in Saginaw. And I remember her telling me... Now, when, when was this? In their early 1900s. Okay. So, so b- right pre-World War I? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so when she, when she got here, I remember her telling... Uh, she told me when she got here to the United States and to Saginaw, she said everything was so beautiful and it was paved and the Danube was blue. And I got to, to the Michigan and into Saginaw and the river was dirty. And yeah. the streets <laughs> weren't paved. And she said, what am I doing here? Right. Um, but she didn't go to school. She had to work. And so she had to clean houses. So she and her mother cleaned houses. And um, the interesting thing was, and I didn't know this about her until she passed away, was that um, as she was cleaning the houses, she was pretty good very conscientious. And so the women that she cleaned her houses really liked her and they were all pretty wealthy women. And so they would give her the Wall Street Journal and they they taught her how to invest in the stock market. And so she started to invest in the stock market. And um, and it was funny because 
after my great grandfather passed away, I'm trying to remember, this was in the 80s, um, she moved to like this little studio apartment. She had a little pull out bed. You know, it was just this, you know, we thought, oh, poor great grandmother. We'd take her food. And when she died, she had a fortune. <laughs> she had made it in the stock market. <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> so it was great. a great story. But, but she was just really like, um, um, just super driven, and and it would be really just fun to just sit down with her and just like say, "Wow, how did you get all that money? <laughs> what exactly did you do?" Yes, and how it's to me, it's really fascinating when someone has a lot of money and then either just doesn't spend any of it, right, or spends it in really interesting ways, but very non traditional ways, like. Uh, but you're talking about the studio apartment, like Warren Buffett is still driving the same truck. I think that he was driving in the fifties right. or the sixties, <laughs> but also his company has, you know, has a private jet now because it's just more efficient for him to right. be able to go to this and that. But it's so same truck, private jet and the company owns the, you know, Berkshire Hathaway sure, owns right. the jet, but, um, it's hard to reconcile, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it, it, I like, think he lives in the same house too, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think so in Omaha, mm-hmm. as, as I recall. Um, but, uh, yeah, but spending profiles for especially really wealthy people who don't spend in traditional ways. That's, right. that's a fascinating well, one I guess that's me. why they're wealthy, because they don't spend all their money. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, that's definitely, <laughs> definitely a big piece of it. Um, we, this, is, this is a little bit of a cheat, because we've talked to some degree about this already, but you might have another thought. Uh, most brief, briefly, most important piece of business or career advice that our listeners might not have heard before. I don't know if, it, if people have not heard this, but you just have to try new things, mm-hmm. right? And I think that, that people get, just like with the reputation or the trust, you get locked in a box. Yeah. And you have to be willing to, to take on new things and try new things out. Um, I think the, the piece of advice that, that I, um, no one ever told me this, but I learned it um, pretty early in my career was, if you just do the things that you're supposed to do, you're going to be better than 95% of the people. <laughs> and so it's really not that hard, yeah. right? I mean, just do what you're supposed to do and do it reliably. Now, if you, well, you want to stand out, then you do some other things as well. But I mean, p- part of it's just that baseline. Do what you say you're going to do. Yeah, half of it is showing up. Yep. And another quarter of it is showing up just a little bit more. The other best piece of mm-hmm. advice that I got in the MBA program was once you once you sort for you know, GMAT scores and, you know, college GPA and a few other factors. The thing that really correlates with success in the MBA program is show up for class, obviously, but everybody did that. Right. And then go to your professor's office hours. So show up (laughs) a little extra. Exactly. Um, But what is your fondest memory of Texas A&M? Um, I, I like the collaborative nature of it. So, yeah. I mean, if, if if you think about our department in management, it's very similar to, I think, how the MBA de- the programs run. Uh, people pitch in, they help each other. It's collaborative. Um, everybody shares in people's successes and people are happy for one another. And, 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 and it's a good place to be. So I came back. Do you have anyone you would like to send good bull? Uh, my daughter, we're taking her to New York tomorrow. So she's moving. She's, uh, she's uh, starting a job with Deloitte Consulting. So oh. she's um, pretty excited. I think she's a little nervous. I know we're scared to death. So, <laughs> but um, yeah. Best of luck to her and safe travels to all of you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to stay up to date on our latest videos, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to receive notifications. If you're in a rush or on the road, you can still join us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. If you want to learn more about us or our guests, please visit our website at maze.tamu.edu slash podcasts. Also, please check out Maze Business School's academic programs. They're the sponsors of our show, and you can find them in the description. Thanks, and gig'em.